Okay, well, let's jump into our passage this morning. I hope you got a bulletin when you came in. If not, you can uh, get one in back, or you can go to our uh, YouTube page and get a, uh, a digital copy there to look at on your phone. Listen, it was four years ago, almost exactly, it was March 13th, it was a Wednesday night. And it was a typical March in Minnesota, alternating freezing and wet. And on that March 13th, four years ago, we had a torrential downpour. Now, normally, every year, we have to be very careful to remove all the snow that's up against the building on this side of the building, because the size of this roof is such, if there's a rain, a heavy rain in March, with the snowbank, all of that water comes off the roof, it tends to hit that snowbank and come this way. Uh, most years were pretty good about this. For whatever reason, we did not do it four years ago, and someone comes running into youth group on that Wednesday night. The church is flooding. And there was, I, it was incredible. There was like a river running in under this wall right over here, coming down here and pooling down here. So everybody sprang into action. We emptied the senior high youth group, and all of those students and a bunch of adults came outside with shovels. Joel was running the church plow truck, and there's probably 40, 50 people out here desperately shoveling, trying to attack this pile to stop this water coming in. And let me tell you, it was miserable because it was a freezing ice cold. Does anyone remember doing this? Any of you part of this? Mm -hmm. The others mostly died from traumatic <laughs> experiences. Only Chris, only Chris survived. Uh, well done, Chris. And the thing was, when you were over here shoveling, all of that water was coming off that roof in a steady stream. It was basically hitting right where you had to stand. And it was a long night. I went back and forth between being out there doing that, and I was running a shop back in here, trying to keep the water from going too far under the stage. But you know what? An hour and a half later, the pile was gone. The church had been saved. It was an interesting example for me to think about uh, our church coming together in kind of a crisis with a mission. Like, okay, we were presented with a big problem. There was a clear mission that had to be taken care of. And boy, everybody just pulled together and attacked that. And, and it was done like this, despite being a pretty miserable experience. I mean, the students were troopers. I mean, they put up with a lot that night, but we got the mission accomplished. And I couldn't help but think about that story uh, this week as I was getting ready to focus in on this particular core value uh, that we're looking at that our church has adopted uh, this week. So let's look at that on your outline. If you got one, it is part one. And the one we're focusing on today, a core value we've said, this is what we want to be about as a church. We put it this way, mission over comfort. And man, that was that night. Okay, here's the mission. We got to save the church. Comfort doesn't matter. Everyone was out there miserable but did it anyway, accomplished the mission. And notice on your outline how we have, have, have fleshed this slogan out a little bit. We value engaging in Christ's mission to make disciples of all nations, a command which means our concern is not just Grand Rapids, but the world. We seek to continue our legacy of strong missionary service and support, joining in the work of God all around the world. So in Christian terminology and usage, you will hear this term missions or missionary. And this gets, you, gets used in a variety of different ways. If you flip over to the back of your outline, I notice I've given you some bullet points of four different related words and kind of a clarification as far as this goes. But look at the third bullet point. Look at what I have in bold there. Here's a pretty good definition of what we're talking about when we're talking in Christian circles about missions. Put it this way, missions. It's used to refer to the work of the church in reaching across cultural, religious, ethnic, and geographical barriers to advance the work of making disciples of all nations. So notice the concern of our church is not just us as the people in this room. Concern is not only for just the people in our town of Grand Rapids, but one of our concerns as a church is actually for the worldwide advancement of the message of Jesus. And here again is a strong legacy of this church. This congregation has been around over 80 years. And if you look at one of the strengths, undoubtedly, of this congregation, it has been missions and advancing this. 
A few weeks ago, we were here, if you were here, we were talking about giving, and I noted that last year, the way we do missions giving here, individuals in our church support individual missionaries that our church has approved, and, and we track all that money. That money comes to the church. The church collects it, sends it all to the missionary, and those numbers from last fiscal year at this church were that 32% of all the money that came through our building went out to these different missions and ministries. And so over the years, this church has had a strong legacy of sending missionaries, of the pastors of this church having been missionaries themselves, in every case, I think, but me. Uh, <clears throat> and, and we continue to do so. But this is, so here's one of those core values that is not aspirational only, but actual. Okay, here is an actual strength of this church. Uh, but we don't want to let up on it. We want to keep this one going. So we have a list of like, 30-some ministries and missions our church supports. Uh, we've narrowed that down to a list of 12 we call main focus ones, which are ones with a personal connection, particularly here with the congregation, and we'll highlight these 12 through the year. Now, we should note that if you look at that list of 30-plus uh, ministries, missions, and organizations, not all of those fit that tight definition of missions in the sense like we just defined. Because in a certain technical sense, Christian missions should, I think, in a technical sense, be limited to the idea of cross-cultural work. So what we do here in our church to reach out to people in our community, properly speaking, we wouldn't call this missions, okay? So a, a, a very good ministry like Miracle Bible Camp. So here's a great uh, a ministry that our church supports, but we wouldn't want to call that missions in, then sen in that sense either. We probably want to reserve this, this term in its technical sense, missions, talking about the cross-cultural effort to bring the message of Jesus around the world to those that have not heard it. Because notice there's tons of churches in Grand Rapids already. There is a gospel witness here, all right? So mission accomplished at one level. But there are places in the world, people groups in the world, where there are no churches present up and functioning. And so in the most technical sense, when we're talking about missions, we're talking about advancing uh, cross-culturally in places where there are not established churches that are able to do the work, okay? All right, so let's look at our scriptural mandate for this. We're going to look at one chunk this morning out of Romans 15. This is towards the end of the book of Romans. This is written by the Apostle Paul. And what he's done here, he's written this letter to the Romans, a church he's never been to. He's preparing the way for him to come. He knows there's controversy about him. So he is introducing himself to this church in Rome by laying out what he believes in preparation for his own coming. In Romans 14, what he's done is dealt with an issue in the church of Romans uh, of, of where there's been conflict between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in dispute over the issue of what food is appropriate to eat or not. So he's tried to navigate them through this, saying, hey, you need to be gracious to one another, accept people are in different places. And then he turns to what we'll look at here today in Romans chapter 15. So we'll start here at verse 7. Look what Paul writes on your outline. He says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So he's talking about those two groups, the Jew Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians, with the ability to rub each other the wrong way. He says, look, you guys need to accept one another just as Jesus accepted you. And look at the purpose, to bring praise to God. If you look at the back of that outline I gave you today, glance at that little growth map that incorporates our mission statement. Notice what is the number one part of our mission statement. It is to worship God. This is our number one priority. Paul would agree. And so notice he urges here the Christians and Jew, the Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome. He says, look, accept one another like Jesus did. This would bring praise, honor, and worship to God. Verse 8. Why? For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. Moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So here Paul describes the work of Jesus. He says, Jesus has done two great things. He came to help Israel, and he came to help non-Israel, the Gentiles. He came as a servant to Israel so that the promises to the patriarchs could be confirmed. Patriarchs, that's like Abraham, Jacob, the ancient forefathers of the Jewish people. God had made promises to them. And Jesus came to fulfill those promises to Israel so God would be seen to be truthful. But Jesus also comes to bring God's mercy beyond Israel to all peoples that will accept Jesus. So when Paul is talking about the promises made to the patriarchs, here's one of the greatest. Look on the screen. This is Genesis 12. God said this to Abram 
right? The forefather of the Jewish people. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And look at this part. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So on one hand, Jesus comes to fulfill the promises uh, made to Israel for their own good, that they would be God's people. So Jesus comes as Savior to Israel. But notice what's said there in this sort of vague prophecy. We don't know how it's going to work at the beginning. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, in the ultimate sense, how are all peoples on earth blessed through Abraham? Well, it is through the work of Jesus, Abraham's distant descendant. And so Paul would see here in in. In um, Genesis 12, this prophecy, this promise that through Israel would come blessings to all peoples. And now we know this has come through Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again to defeat death, not only for Israel, but also for all peoples, all nations who will come to Jesus and accept that gift of forgiveness. So Paul turns to this in verse 9. Moreover, the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Right, So the work of Jesus is not only for Israel, but also for all people who will accept him. Okay, so our theme today is what we call missions, right? which is bringing the good news of Jesus to all nations, to those people groups and parts of the world that have not yet heard about him or embraced him. So look here at that word Gentiles. Gentiles. This is a word used from the Jewish perspective. Meaning, a Gentile is anyone who was not Jewish. So, how many of you are Gentiles? If you're not Jewish, uh, you belong to this category of Gentile. Now, um, sometimes this word also gets translated in the Bible as nations. It's the same word, Gentiles, uh, nations. So, for example, look down to verse 12. Here's a quotation. From the Old Testament. Look what Paul writes. The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. Why don't you circle that? Look at the next line. In him the Gentiles will hope. Will hope. Circle that word Gentiles. That is the exact same word. The word Gentiles is the same Greek word that means nations. All right? Well, why is this important? Well, because of this famous verse and its implications for us on this. Look at the screen, Matthew 28, Jesus' last words in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all what? Nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. So notice there's that key word about God's mandate to the church to bring the message of Jesus, to make disciples of who? All nations. So I think I put it in bold on your outline. If you glance over this paragraph we're looking at today in Romans 15, look at all the times Paul uses the word Gentiles. So understand, in each case, when he is using the word Gentiles, he's using the exact same word as here for nations. So when Paul is talking about all the Gentiles, he's talking about all the people groups, all the nations of the world that we are commanded to bring the gospel to. And by the way, when we're saying nations, we shouldn't think Nation state, like Ukraine or um, Ethiopia. Rather, we should think of people groups. This word for Gentile or nation is the word ethnos. We get our word ethnicity from. And so notice in one nation, there may be a ton of different tribes or people groups. And so, sure, in one country, maybe called Indonesia, maybe there are churches in Indonesia, but there are going to be sub-tribes and people groups within the country of Indonesia that have no churches and no gospel witness and no representation for Jesus. So this is the way we want to think about this. Okay, so Paul says, Jesus came for Israel, but also the nations, all the Gentiles. And now he's going to pick a bunch of Bible verses from the Old Testament to support this point and say, look, this was God's plan all along for all the Gentiles, all the nations to come alongside Israel as God's people. So look at the first one. This is from 2 Samuel or Psalm 18. It's in both places. Paul says, it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. So this is a weird one. This is written by David. It's weird because if you go back and look at this, this is a psalm where David is celebrating military victory over Gentiles. So what he's saying is here, I will praise your name, God, among the Gentiles that I have defeated. 
Well, as Paul reads this, he pulls this verse and looks at it, and he recognizes Jesus comes as the great descendant of David. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that David was the beginning to be. And so he is able to read this through the lens of what Paul knows, what now Jesus has done. He has died on the cross and rose again to save all nations, all Gentiles. So he's able to say it's like Jesus has defeated the Gentiles. He's, they're now under his control, but now Jesus offers them mercy. So it's a weird twist on it, but this is very much in keeping with first century sort of rabbinic interpretation. Uh, look at this next one. Again, it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. This one's much more straightforward. This is Moses singing a song and rejoicing in Deuteronomy 32. In this song, he imagines, he envisions the unfaithfulness of Israel, their punishment, and their return. And as Moses envisions that return and restoration, we have this line, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. In other words, all the way back then, Moses envisioned a time when Israel would be restored, and along that would come the other nations rejoicing along with Paul says, you see, we live in the time of fulfillment. We live in the time of restoration. The Messiah has come. The gospel is here. And now the nations, the Gentiles, are rejoicing uh, with God because they too have accepted Jesus. Again, in verse 11, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. That one's pretty straightforward. A psalm talking about all nations praising God. Now, you and I are so used to that idea. As Gentiles, we're like, well, duh. Of course, we're so used to it. Why wouldn't God want me on his team. I'm awesome. We're tempted to think. In reality, we aren't. We're in great need of God's mercy and his grace. And we forget that as things originally stood, God's chosen people was Israel. Salvation was only there. But through God's mercy, because of what Jesus has done, the gospel has gone out. And now you and I, who were once separate from God's people, have been offered a place united with God's people, receiving the same salvation. So we're so used to it, we forget that this was not a given in the first century. Like there was, there was conflict among the early Christians. How exactly should Gentiles be welcomed in when they believe in Jesus? We're so far downstream of that, we forget how gracious and radical this really is. Verse 12, again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. So there's a direct messianic prophecy. Jesse was the father of who? David. So Jesse is David's father. So when he talks about the root of Jesse, he's saying, look, the, Isaiah prophesies a descendant of Jesse, really meaning a descendant of David, will one day come. And so this is Jesus who comes in fulfillment of this. And look what was said in Isaiah. In him the Gentiles will hope. So see, Paul is saying, look, guys, you see, in the Old Testament, God's concern was not only Israel, but God was prophesying through Isaiah a day when God's salvation, when the hope of the Gentiles and the nations, not just Israel, would come. And this is what Paul is seeing the fulfillment of in his day and in our day. Now he picks up that word hope. Look what he says in 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's like Paul explaining the biblical basis. Now he turns to his own work and what he's done in his life. Verse 14, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Yet I've written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So here, Paul presents his job of going around and sharing the gospel with the nations, the Gentiles, as like a priest of Israel. And as a priest would bring a sacrifice into the temple and offer it to God, Paul is saying, look, it's like what I'm doing. I'm gathering believers out of the Gentile world who are accepting Jesus. They are purified, and I'm offering them to God. And he's drawing on the very last chapter of Isaiah here, Isaiah 66, where Isaiah envisions the Gentiles at the end times, the time of restoration, bringing offerings to God. And so as Paul sees the Gentiles believing in Jesus and coming into God's people, Paul is offering them to God and seeing, Paul is seeing a kind of fulfillment of what Isaiah expected there as, in prophesied, as is prophesied in Isaiah 66. 17, therefore, Paul says, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything 
accept what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you were here last week, we kind of wrestled with what does it mean to do something with the strength that God provides and not our own strength? What does that look like to attempt some service to God depending on him and not us? And we interacted on that a little bit. Notice that's the sort of thing Paul is saying here. He says, look, I, I won't venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished in me. Paul is aware that this is actually Christ who has done this through him. Paul had traveled all around the Mediterranean, starting churches, planting churches, maintaining con contact with them via letters and, and representatives. It's an incredible work. Paul's the greatest missionary we've ever had. It's incredible what he accomplished there in the first 20, 30 years. Paul says, look, this was Christ who did this through me. Well, what's his evidence of that? Well, look, verse 19, again. By the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. So here Paul claims that there were miracles worked through him in the midst of this ministry. Now, this is a remarkable passage. That's a remarkable verse. And it's remarkable because... It's only one of, well, debatably. It's one clear example of two. There are two clear examples in Paul where he claims to have performed miracles or that miracles were accomplished through him in his ministry. And both of these are undisputed letters of Paul. All right, Romans and the other one I'm talking about in 2 Corinthians. No one questions these letters are really written by Paul. And so even atheist, agnostic Bible scholars say, yep, that is the Apostle Paul. And there are these two passages here in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, where Paul claims to have performed miracles in his ministry. Now, this is so remarkable because I, I, I heavily researched this for a dissertation when I was still in seminary. And I went searching and hunting throughout ancient literature to try to find any other examples anywhere in the centuries around the first century if we could find a document where we knew the authorship was authentic one, and two, the author claimed to have performed miracles. I found nothing, and I scoured pretty hard. Now, it doesn't mean those examples aren't out there, but what it does mean is they are not common and very difficult to find. It turns out that Paul and also Jesus are the two most strongly evidenced miracle workers anywhere around our century. We can make the most robust case historically that Jesus and Paul were miracle workers compared to anybody else. And it's incredible that these two passages in Paul, we have first-person claims where no one doubts this is really Paul where he claims to have performed miracles. Now look, historical tools cannot prove that Paul performed miracles but, or Jesus. But what historical tools can demonstrate is that at least... People thought Jesus had performed miracles, and people thought Paul had performed miracles, and that Jesus thought he performed miracles, and Paul thought he performed miracles. And so in that sense, we can make an incredibly strong historical case that Paul and Jesus were miracle workers in this sense. Um, and God still does this sort of thing, too. Uh, there are still signs and wonders that take place, often especially on the frontier of when the gospel is pushing into new places. Um, did you hear about this revival that took place in the last month or so down at Asbury, Kentucky? Anybody been following this? So Asbury is a Christian school down there in Kentucky. And they, the students went to chapel one Wednesday for a chapel service. And that chapel service did not end for like three weeks, a day and night. And so there was just a great outpouring of God's spirit. Tens of thousands of people descended from all over the country on this school campus. And um, I, I just happened to say, you know what, I want to look. I just said, what kind of miracle reports are there coming out of this? So look what one guy posted on Facebook. This is a guy named David Bennett. Don't know who he is, don't know anything about him. But seems to be an ordinary guy uh, with nothing, no point to make or nothing to prove. Look what he posted on Facebook. Last night, Twyla and I, his wife, decided to go to Asbury College to experience God's presence in the revival awakening that's been going on since last Wednesday. On our way there, I was praying, asking God to heal a newly discovered chronic health issue that arose over the past several weeks. I told him I knew the healing could take place anywhere that he chose, but if he could do it tonight, I would be grateful. So we arrived, went into the auditorium to experience an atmosphere that was overwhelming with God's presence. 
I can't affect, it can't effectively be told. It has to be experienced. The hour or so that we planned to be there quickly turned into three and a half hours. If I tried to explain what I saw, it would be that common society showed up to experience God in a setting that required nothing except your attention to God himself. Nobody cared or paid attention to your worship because they were engulfed in their own worship. When we left at 9 p.m., there were hundreds of people outside worshiping God, waiting to come inside as space became available. So I want to fast forward to today when I had to go to the doctor to get the long-term meds he told me I had to take for my health issue. When they did the exam, they looked at me and said, I'm not sure what happened, but your health issue is no longer there. God healed this body of mine in the calmness of worship in Wilmore, Kentucky last night. To God be the glory. Now, for us to prove that and say that was a miraculous healing, we'd have to investigate. We don't want to see some hard facts before we say, okay, this is like a verified miracle. But for now, we'll just take him at his word. This sort of thing happens. It reminded me of something that happened here a few years ago. Uh, there's a, there's a four-times-a-year worship gathering in Grand Rapids called Worship in the Pines. Different churches come together. And I went to this one night. I was speaking at it. It's three years ago or something, and Brian was playing guitar that night. And so, you know, nothing crazy about this. There was, you know, we'd sing 45 minutes of music. I got up, and I just gave a message on the resurrection, 45 more minutes of music. Well, a few weeks later, a guy came to my office and said, hey, I got to tell you a story. I'm so dumb. I can't believe I didn't. I don't know what was wrong with me. I didn't write it down. I didn't write down his name. I, don't, I didn't write down the details of the story. Looking back, I'm just incredulous. Like, what was I thinking? So I don't remember the details of this very good. But this was a guy from out of town, all right? He lived down somewhere in Minneapolis. And for like 20 years, he had a terrible eye problem in one of his eyes. And so one day, he went to the doctor's office, the eye doctor's office down in Minneapolis, because of this problem. And there was another person in the waiting room from Grand Rapids. They happened to talk. This guy from down there said, well, in a few weeks, I'm going to be coming up to do some work in Grand Rapids. And our Grand Rapids person, I forget who he was, <laughs> said to him, well, if you're up there this Saturday night at the Evangelical Free Church, there's this worship in the pines. You should go to that. The guy said, oh, yeah, I'll go to that. And so this is the guy that's now talking to me in my office a few weeks later. He said, so I came up and I went to that worship service at the Evangelical Free Church. And as we were just in there, my bad eye was just running, 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 like the whole time. And he said, when I walked out, it was healed. He's like, I don't know how to explain it, he said. And this had been a long problem. Now, none of us were talking about healing that night. No one was praying for healing. It's like God just reached down and went, nope, all right, you're fixed. So it was just a remarkable example of a kind of spontaneous healing that God worked on that guy's behalf. I can't, can't believe I did not even write down his name. So this is the sort of thing Paul says happened through his ministry. But the stuff that God did through Paul was, of course, way more dramatic than those things. Um, look at this line here from Jerusalem. What verse is that? I don't know, maybe 23 or 24. It's describing his ministry. So from Jerusalem, all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Look at this picture. Paul had launched out from Jerusalem, and he had planted churches all along uh, the Mediterranean up there to modern-day Albania across from Italy. Verse 20, It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. Remember we talked about last week, God gives everyone their own different gifting. God equips us all in certain ways to fulfill our own function in the body of Christ and to serve him in a specific way. So Paul had a clear insight into his own gifting. Paul understood that his call and his gifting was to be a frontier pioneer church planting missionary. He understood his call was to go and start churches in cities where there were no churches yet. And he would do this in major cities, set up the church, and then expect co-workers to launch out in surrounding regions around it. And so Paul says, tunk, 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 I've been working my way around the Mediterranean, but notice he is not content, he is not done. 23, now there is no more place for me to work in these regions. And since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. So notice Paul is planning to push west to Spain. He wants to bring the gospel over there. And on his way, he wants to go through Italy and stop and see the famous Church of Rome. Now we see another purpose he has for this visit as he goes on. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there 
after I have enjoyed your company for a little while. So notice Paul is writing the book of Romans as an introduction for himself as he's going to visit. But what is he wanting to be accomplished? What does he want to happen as a result of this visit? He is hoping that he comes and spends some time with the Romans, and as he heads on to Spain, they will support him in that mission. So he's hoping they would support him in prayer, come along behind him spiritually. He would also be hoping that the Roman church would give him financial support to help him and his team push on to Spain. And he would also be hoping that they would maybe even send some personnel and some people to go with him. So we see that this this whole letter of Romans, it's an intro, a presentation of what Paul teaches as Paul the missionary wants to come and visit and enlist their support as he continues uh, his push to new ground in Spain. So that reminds us that this work of missions, the cross-cultural bringing of the gospel to places that don't have a functioning witness, this is not just the work of the individual family or person that goes there. This is a task given to the whole church. And it's one that can't be performed just by the solo individual off there on their own. It takes a whole team. And so this is one of the things our church has excelled at. The sending of individuals, but also the prayer support and the financial support to keep those people out there. So just like Paul needed prayer support, financial support, personnel support to maintain and establish his missions, so too our current day cross-cultural workers. And God has done a lot of this support through the work of this church uh, over the last years. Okay, so what's the bottom line from this passage? It's a long one. We see glimpses into Paul's work. We see glimpses into his heart, how God had performed miracles through him and opened doors for him. But we also see the biblical Old Testament underpinnings for bringing the good news of Jesus to the Gentile world that he was so focused on. Well, let's put it this way. Make God's mission your mission. Make God's mission your mission. Three suggestions for this. First, by elevating to first place the goal of extending God's glory and greatness to all. We talk about what is God's mission. It's the first definition you'll see in the back of your outline. You can look at that later. But there's a sense in which God's mission in creation is to display his honor, his greatness, and his glory. And this is done in part by the spreading of the good news of Jesus as broken humans are restored and redeemed and welcome Jesus' gift of forgiveness and come into a relationship with God where they're able to praise him and honor him. So second, first we want to elevate this to first place. That's why we make that, sorry, yeah, go back, first, all right. This is why we put worship God as the first part of our church mission statement. This has to be our number one priority as Christians. Our number one concern has to be God's greatness, his glory, his renown. Jesus thought the same thing. This is why he taught us to pray first in the prayer he expects us to pray every day. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be sanctified. So the very first thing Jesus teaches us to pray every day is a prayer that God's honor, God's name would be established among people, that people would acknowledge God's greatness, that they would sanctify, set apart his name, his reputation. So this has got to be what burns hot at our heart of what is most important to us, God's greatness, glory, and renown. Okay, second, by accepting that this goal requires establishing churches among all people groups. Remember, we walked through Revelation last year. We see several glimpses of this great mass group in heaven. It says, from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Remember that? God has ordained to save, to draw praise from all people groups, every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so the church is given this part of this great mission. And for example, the Great Commission, make disciples of all nations, make disciples of all the Gentiles. John Piper famously wrote, missions exist because worship doesn't. And so the work of missions, bring the gospel to others, this is a means to an end to bring greater praise, honor, and glory to God. Now again, it's always good to acknowledge a caveat or a question mark here. Isn't that selfish of God, we could ask? 
God makes everything about him? We have to praise him and honor him? Isn't that selfish? Isn't that narcissistic? And the answer is no. Okay, because God understands that for humans to be in the position of worshiping him, honoring him, this is also the greatest possible blessing for humans. We flourish when we find our proper function as created beings bringing him honor and glory. So he also commands this not only for his glory, but because this is also our greatest good as humanity. So it's not selfish. If we did it, it'd be selfish. For him to do it, it is anything but. Third, by giving up your comfort to either work cross-culturally or support cross-cultural work. So again, we're zeroing in on that technical sense of missions, meaning the task of the church to expand, to bring the gospel, the good news, to establish churches in people groups around the world where there are not yet any or there are not yet enough. And so notice, if this is a great mission of our life, then this takes precedence over our own comfort. Anyone who goes as a career cross-cultural worker, they give up a lot of comfort. And also, it's possible if we are going to financially support this work, uh, we might wish to give up some comfort as well. We may choose to make some sacrifices to plug in and to enable others to accomplish uh, this mission and this task. And so our church supports a whole list of people that have done this, uh, that have sacrificed their own comfort for the sake of this mission. Let me give you an example. All right, M many of you know these people. This is Tim and Julie Nelson, okay? So these guys have been long-term missionaries in Honduras. <clears throat> done a lot of good stuff, okay? Established relationships, taught people, done all sorts of things. Now, they are close to retirement age, all right? It would be very easy for them just to coast, so, you know, I would give it five, eight more years, ten more years. We're comfortable here in Honduras. We've been here forever. We know the language. We know the culture. We've got lots of friends. Okay, but these guys are not content to coast because they recognize the great purpose, the great call for the church is to establish churches cross-culturally in other people groups where there are none. And so what they're working on for the last several years is mobilizing Christians in Honduras to go as missionaries to the African country of Angola because Christians coming from Honduras can get a better in in a place like Angola than a smiling American because we are not loved by much of the world, all right? And this is a task that everyone is called on, the church in Honduras as well. And so they don't want to just organize this. They want to lead from the front. So what they are doing, they are planning on going to Angola themselves. And to do this, they are spending an entire year learning Portuguese because this is the language uh, that they speak in Portugal. So they uprooted and they moved to Portugal, all right, to do language studies. They've been there since August. Now there's been some visa debacle because of the country requirements. They have to stay in the U.S. for a certain number of months. So now they're back in the U.S., but learning Portuguese full time so that they know Portuguese enough to go to Angola, to spend time there, to live there, to open doors, to mobilize Christian missionaries from Honduras to get there. Now here's a beautiful example of pursuing God's mission over comfort. Again, they could have just coasted. We're in Honduras. We're doing good ministry. We're comfortable here. But they weren't content with staying comfortable. And so I so admire them uh, just going off on this great adventure, rolling the dice, and initiating this uh, great effort. So it's a wonderful example for us of following God's mission over comfort. Well, today we consider this core value, mission over comfort. And here's one that our church has a strong legacy in. And we wish to continue prioritizing uh, the great mission of the Christian church, which is to advance the gospel in other people groups cross-culturally where there is not yet an established uh, gospel witness to Jesus. And we look today at Romans 15 where Paul weaves together uh, his own experience, uh, passages from the Old Testament, uh, prophesying uh, the Gentiles and all peoples of the earth coming alongside Israel to be uh, forgiven, restored, and honoring God in the last days. And Paul recognizes his key role to fulfill in this. And we said, bottom line, make God's mission your mission. Recognize that this is God's call upon you if you are a believer in Jesus to serve in some capacity uh, to advance this purpose and this mission. So four years ago that night, it was raining, and it was raining miserably, and I was so proud of our youth group students as they went out there and just with cheerful good attitudes stood under that 
pouring freezing cold water for a couple hours and, and, and help move that snow beam. But you know what's interesting? It's miserable, right? Totally uncomfortable. You got soaking wet, freezing cold. But after the fact, I heard from one of the parents of one of those youth group students, and they said, the student said, you know what, that was my favorite night of youth group. That's the most fun I've ever had at youth group. <laughs> they loved it. At least that one did. And I think part of that was, despite the discomfort, they recognized that here was this great mission, this great fight, this great achievement, and to be able to join in with others and do it despite the discomfort and to accomplish it, I think it gave them a great feeling of satisfaction and purpose and fulfillment. I bet you Paul felt the same way. Uh, I bet you Tim and Julie Nelson will, will feel the same way when they look at the fruit of what they are doing there in Angola. So even though the call of this mission is one that is at the expense of our comfort, I think if we follow down that path in whatever way God calls us to, we'll find at the end of the day, we'll be very glad we did. So go out into the world in peace. And that rings with some significance. That's chosen deliberately, that first line. Go out into the world in peace. Notice that is a, a blessing and a call not only to go out into Grand Rapids, but also for us as Christians to go out into the whole world. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Repay no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.